So on to our main event, um, our speaker today, Vicky Allen. Um, so in 2009, at the age of 16, uh, Vicky realised that she wanted to follow in the footsteps of her father and complete the local referee course. However, she was met with a lot of negative attitudes toward women in what is and was seen as a very male sport. Vicky set out to prove them wrong and completed her course, only then to fall in love with this part of the sport and continue her journey down the refereeing pathway. 12 years later, and Vicky is now one of the top female football officials in Scotland, having represented Scotland on the international stage at World Cup qualifiers, Euro qualifiers and the Champions League. She continued her passion for gender equality and representing women in the sport, working with the Equal Playing Fields Initiative, through which she has broken two world records with the group. She's worked with girls across the globe in some of the most restrictive countries for women in football to allow them the chance to play football and develop their skills. Vicky was formerly the Youth Ambassador of Refereeing in Scotland, working with the Scottish FA, and is currently working as a Supplier Relationship Manager for Aberdeen. After Vicky's talk, there'll be some time for questions as well, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on perspe and perspectives on uh, the, this month's theme of DARE. But that is enough for me. Over to Vicky for her talk. Ain't no mountain high enough from Dalkeith to the Dead Sea. Thanks everyone and I am delighted to be here especially for your first hybrid event so thanks very much for um, asking me to come along today and speak. i um, really excited so yeah as uh, Rebecca said um, my name is Vicky Allen um, I currently work as a supplier relationship manager for a company called Aberdeen in Edinburgh and my hobby as I think they like to call it is refereeing although it seems to take up a lot a lot a lot of time uh, <laughs> in my life um, but I absolutely love it and, and wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I'm here today. I'm, I'm very excited about the topic there. I think it's really interesting and, and um, loved hearing um, some of your comments there about what's the most daring thing you've been up to. And we're talking about how it can have different perspectives from, from, from yourself and what is daring to, to you. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be able to talk about that today. Um, and what I'll talk about is probably my journey. Um, how I got to where I am today, um, a little bit of, of um, introduction from that, and then kind of the second part about, um, yeah, what I'm up to now and trying to help others also um, achieve and dare uh, for themselves and, and see what they can achieve and, and push the boundaries. So, yeah, so how did I get to where I am? Um, yep. There's me, nice and cute, um, I think. Um, so yeah, so I kind of grew up in a, a football background. So um, that's my parents, um, Crawford and Yvonne. Um, my dad started refereeing uh, the year I was born, so grew up with it. Um, basically, yeah, that, that was my straight introduction right in there. Um, whole of my life, following him around different football grounds. Um, so when people are like, oh, who'd you support? I genuinely, genuinely don't don't support anyone. I just do love the sport. I just love going to football and getting involved and, and chatting about it and meeting the community and people and, and speaking about it with with folk and enjoying it and um, being part of it. Um, so yeah, so followed him about all the different games. He he actually became a, a category one referee, which is um, the top level of men's football in Scotland. So he was doing the SPL. Um, and he also got a few sneaky games abroad and um, without having an actual FIFA badge. Um, I do like to stall in there. I'm like, you never got one of these, but uh, I did. So, um, so I do like to throw that one in there every now and then. And uh, my mum, she actually worked for um, a little club called Heart of Melodian in Edinburgh. Um, um, so she had the introduction there. She was there for about 18 years um, from when she was 16. And then uh, she actually moved to another little club called Hibernian. So again, there is no, uh, <laughs> no, no fan perspective from me because she, she actually worked at both them, um, which, yeah. Don't think many people, uh, would, if you're a fan, would, would uh, appreciate that. But uh, but yeah, uh, she actually works in dentistry now, so absolutely out of the, out of the game, literally now. But um, but yeah, so I, I grew up with football, and um, and that I loved it. That like I say, I never really had any ambitions to go and um, become a referee. I just liked it. Just like I also like to throw it there. I cannot play, can't kick a ball to save my life. So that that wasn't an option either. Um, but, but was I pressured? is the question. Uh, there, there's a little doll I got when I was younger. Apparently it was to help me tie my shoes, but um, but yeah, it was given to me from a very young age, um, little referee doll. Um, so I thought, thought that was quite funny. Um, and we actually found it when we were clearing out my uh, mum and dad's uh, garage recently. 
but yeah how, how, how did I go about it so became when I turned 16 in Scotland that's the year you can go and sit the referee exam so it's 2009 I'm in I'm in fifth year of high school and uh, I turned around to my friends and said oh I could actually go and become a referee now and uh, they turned around and they just went girls don't referee girls don't play football and like because it wasn't wide in the media at that point and obviously it's getting better today and stuff but back then the back pages of the paper etc you wouldn't see any any female footballers really so I did kind of just go out there originally to prove a point whether that that was right or wrong but uh, so I went I'm going to go do that I'm going to go sit the exam and I'll do a couple games and I'll just prove the point so um I went to Dalkeith hence the the Dalkeith too so to, to Dalkeith and sat the the class which was five weeks at that point in time and um, the exam was still on paper back in those days, so uh, not online. And um, so sat that, and you you watch video clips and, and etc. So I did all that, and then the last part of your exam is to go and do a game, and uh, somebody comes out as a, an advisor, not an observer, to come to advise and help you and just be that friendly face. And um, yeah, it was awful. Missed a red card. Missed like it was probably horrendous. And I was like, what have I done? Uh, and they said, look nobody is a good referee when they first start it's just like doing anything you, you don't you know don't walk where you learn to crawl etc so I was like right okay I'll do another one I'll do another couple and really pushed and put myself out there and, and I fell in love with it I, I genuinely did um it's just such a different angle of the sport I get a front seat to and like I say I, I, I can't uh, can't kick a ball so I wasn't going to get very far playing and um, I'll come into a bit more of like my career and where I've got to but I um, started out in youth football girls and boys doing both so I, I do both men's and women's football and um, domestically um, so past that it started to progress and then I went to university in 2010 and that became a bit of a priority for me obviously I wanted to get my degree um, so still continued refereeing it took a little bit of a back seat but um, um, progressed and then when I finished uni, um, I really, really got stuck in. Um, in Scotland, we have local associations. So I kind of became part of our um, management committee in the Edinburgh and District Referee Association, became the secretary and so on. And I'm now the vice president of the association. Um, so yeah, got quite stuck in. I think people started to notice that I was a bit more, had a bit few more ambitions than just doing the, the youth football at the weekend. So. I really started to, to push on my career and there's some probably highlights of, of, of photos here that, that I've put in but yeah so I had my kind of first SWPL which is the top level of women's football in Scotland in 2009 so I did the line as the assistant referee um, and then I had my first middle in the women's SPL in, in 2012 and did my kind of first main semi-professional line back in 2012 as well and 2014, um, I don't think I've got those actual photos, but um, this one here, for example, um, in the middle on the right is um, the Scottish Cup. So I had the Women's Scottish Cup and Women's um, League Cup in the same year, which that was the year I finished uni. And I think that was probably a turning point for me to start realizing, oh, I could actually do a few more things here than just go and do kids football at the weekend. Um, and then in 2016, um, I got a phone call and the way that the Scottish FA works is um, for an international game, they phone you up. And actually, spookily enough, I was actually on holiday for the weekend in Austria and Vienna. And uh, my phone goes, I'm like, that's a Glasgow number. So I, so I answered it and they said, hey, would you be free to go to Austria? I was like, you're kidding me. In two weeks time, I was like, I'm here right now. Um, but yeah, so I, I actually got to go before I had my FIFA badge as, um, and as the assistant referee too. Um, um, official uh, for Austria v Norway and actually actually was the game of their group that then qualified them to go to the Euros so for me uh, at that point that that probably in my mind was actually the turning point um, and thinking wow wow like this is an unbelievable opportunity and maybe some a way that I can maybe you know travel the world and create a bigger way out, out of this hobby um, and then that kind of um, photo on the top right second and uh, from the top right that is uh, the first ever all-female official team to referee in the men's lowland league um so so we got that game that was that got quite a lot of publicity and um folk were like wow to have three females on a men's game they thought that was quite quite a big thing uh 2016 uh, at the end of the year got a phone call to say they'd like to nominate me for fifa which was just if you told the little girl in fifth year in 2009 you could 
become FIFA when I can't even kick a ball uh, and, and have the opportunity to go and referee some of the top level football in, in the world for women, I, I would never have believed you. So to get that phone call and, and go and do my fitness tests and medicals and things that we have to do and pass them and get the opportunity was unbelievable. And I got my FIFA badge in, in 2017 in the January. Um, and then just a nice one for me in 2017 as well. So the, the middle one at the bottom, um, that was my first game, well, kind of first and last official game with my dad. He retired in 2017. Um, so I think he put a sneaky call in and said, I'd really, really like to get a game with Vicky before um, I finish up. So that was really nice. And it's actually my cousin on the right as well. So it was a bit of a family affair we had for that game, but um, it was really nice. And it was um, lovely to be able to actually get on a game with my dad before, um, before he finished up and I, I know it's a, a big moment for him as well and then I've had since then just it's been a bit of a whirlwind of unbelievable opportunities and there's a few few pictures in there from from Champions League and um, getting to go in referee teams that again if you told to the, the 16 year old me you'd go and referee Wolfsburg and PSG and Atletico Madrid I was standing in the tunnel and you have a bit of a pinch me moment and like I can only imagine it's a bit like the stories my dad tells about the games he went away and did but I was like some of the international players for like the England team and things like that. I was standing in the tunnel. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm checking Tony Duggan's boots. Like, and you can't like you can't show that you're having that moment, but but it was, I was like, yeah, yeah, show me. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Inside, keep it cool, keep it cool. Um, so yeah, so you do kind of have those, those pinch me moments. But yeah, don't get me wrong. It's not always been a pretty picture to get there. It's uh, I make it sound like that was a really easy road to get there, but um it wasn't all sunshine literally um yeah being a female in the men's game that was the first comment that was obviously said to me back and um, when I said I could go and sit the course um and and there's lots of challenges so in, in the game in general there has been sexist comments shouted at me you know the classic get back to the kitchen what are you doing here you don't know the rules and that obviously has an impact on you you just try and block it out and and think about it and, and had comments from managers about my body and things like that and to have those moments while you're refereeing especially when probably now I deal with it better but when I was really young you're getting those comments it's almost like a freeze moment and you don't know what to do and it's just like just get on with it um, and, and and now I know how to deal with it better and helping other girls if they, if they have it thankfully there isn't many situations like that anymore but also um funny things like people not knowing what to call me as well so like I'm um, internationally I'm an assistant referee in Scotland I do um, the middle and on the line but I was on the line and I had some guys behind me once and for those who are interested in football uh, the line yourself is called linesman it's now an assistant referee I think it changed in the 90s to that to, um, to obviously be gender neutral and these guys are behind me and they were like what do we call her like she's not a linesman she's a lineswoman and I could hear this conversation going on obviously I'm refereeing and I'm like whatever just trying to ignore it and the ball went out for a, a, a corner a goal kick or something and they just shouted lioness lioness and I actually had to stop I was like no way no way you've just shouted lioness uh, it was a, a moment and it just obviously funny but it, it, like it just shows you that they didn't even know what to call me and uh that that was maybe only five years ago that 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 was shouted out and you used to show up to ground and they'd be like oh, it's a female what do we do how do we react what and about 10 minutes into the game you're getting treated like any of the guys it's fine you're rubbish just as rubbish as the men uh, referees but um even things like changing facilities etc it, it, it it's Sometimes they're like, oh, here's a broom cupboard. And you're like, great, thanks. Like it's changing now, thankfully. And perceptions are changing now. Um, and there's a lot more females, and you do just show up and they do just know you, et cetera. So so it, it does, but it has been difficult from that perspective. And even the training, obviously, I'm wanting to progress in the men's game. I want to go as far as I can. Um, so um I'm doing a, a lot of men's games in the middle and, and I want to I actually want to be an assistant referee. That's what I prefer. It's a different skill set, just as is any job. Um but I do need to, to go up in the middle first to get there. So even training, obviously, I have to pass the men's fitness test to be able to referee in the men's game. I've got a different body shape, different. And it does just come down to it. But it's fair, for, in my opinion, we'll not get into that today, that I do pass the, the men's test because it's the men's football and it should be just as fit. But I'm smaller and different body shape. And I have to work, in my opinion, a lot harder than some of the guys to be able to run just as fast as them. And also, in fact, when I was training, I said, it's been a few years now and I would quite like to progress there was a bit of a surprise and they were like you 
girl, you want to progress in the men's game? And I was like, yeah, like, why not? I want to, I want to be the best. I want to get as far as my dad. I want to get further than him, you know, so on. Um, and, and there was a bit of a surprise, which I do think is a bit sad, but, um, but it, it's changing now those perceptions, like I say, which, which is great, but it wasn't all sunshine. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm so proud to, you know, have got to where I am today and, and, and pushed and, and really tried. And it also matters to me now that things have changed and we can push others. So, um, you know, helping females to get to where maybe I have or, or to push and even just to be in refereeing. Cause I say that to a lot of the girls when they come through, everybody's aspirations are different. And if you just want to go and referee grassroots football, that's amazing. We need grassroots female referee or just referees in general. And if that's what you want to do, I'm happy to support that. If you want to be the next Shan Massey from England, you know, Rebecca Welsh in England, all, the, all these ones, Phoebe Steinhouse from Germany, Lorraine Watson from Scotland. If you want to be one of them, then I'm happy to help with that as well. And those sorts of things inspired me to get involved in the Youth Ambassadors um, of Change, the Scottish FA. So um, it was the first programme of its kind in football. So it was um, championed by a programme called um, the Captains of Change, I think it was, by UEFA. So different football associations could apply and say, we've got an idea for a programme, can we get some funding? And the Scottish FA's one was a group of young, 20 young people who could represent all the different areas of the game and um, give them a voice back to the Scottish FA because at the end of the day, young people are going to be the future of football. So, you know, they, they need to have some input into it. So it was the first one of its kind. I was the referee youth ambassador. So that was my specific um, topic I looked into, although I got involved with a lot of the other projects as well. Um, so um, supported a lot of uh, young officials um, to give them a voice. And one of the things I created was the referee youth ambassadors have changed. So like I say, the way that Scotland works, it's lots of different associations. Um, north of Scotland, more in Banff, and then down to Central Belt, we've got Edinburgh District, which covers the borders in Edinburgh and Glasgow and all, all the other areas. And for one person, me, to be able to travel to all those places, I thought, I'm not going to be able to hear everybody. So why don't we just put a young person who then feeds into me, but we'll all have, you know, we'll discuss. And there were silly things like referees were coming through and um, they were like, they can't get the kit because like to buy a referee kit it's something like 150 quid 200 pound like I say nobody's a good referee the day they start so do you really want to go out and spend 200 pound and what we realized is that some associations were their senior list members were getting referee kit for free because they're like an SPL but they get every season so can you not hand that kit back we'll give it to the young referees coming through and then they don't have to part so like silly things like that but just us talking we managed to find out all these little things um and also refereeing can be a bit of a lonely world. Um, when you start out, you don't have assistance. It's you in the middle, 22 other folk shouting at you, basically coaches shouting at you. So it was about building that community and support system. Um, and I did that for all young referees in Scotland, but a big passion for me obviously was also the women's side and, um, and what could we um, achieve? And I'd been doing a lot of that stuff even before, before becoming the youth ambassador um, of refereeing. And one of the things that we introduced, um, which, similar things then came into the youth ambassador um, roles um, um, we really worked through. So in Edinburgh, for example, and these numbers do still seem small, I think, but for me, I think it just shows the progress and the change and those numbers can double. So in 2016, we had kind of three active female referees. That sounds crazy. Three out of an association has 350 people, you know, we only had three female referees and that's when I, um, so I became the kind of head of women's in Edinburgh. And um, we did things like introduced WhatsApp groups just to have a community. So you have someone to speak to, buddy systems, you know, things like that. And um, now we're up to 19 active female officials in Edinburgh alone. And we actually had five past the class last week. So we'll be up to 24 now, which is, again, like I say, that's a small number to some, but for me, that's a massive journey that we've been on and to be able to support these girls and to see some of them doing what they're doing. This is just some of the girls like in top left is us, um, introduced enough female only class because for me when I went to the class it was me and 20 guys and you're like oh just speak up 16 as well like you know some of the men are in their, their 20s 30s and um, more mature and uh, did I want to speak up at 16 and be the only female in the room and um, so we did do that and um, we have ran female only classes in the past female training days and then some of the opportunities so at the bottom right is um, Sandy and Neve in Oman refereeing they just went to the tournament in Oman oh, for, for me, why else would you go? Like, I, I probably wouldn't have a reason just to go to a man on holiday so for them to go and experience 
um, to go there. And Sandy, one of our um, one of our um, more mature um, female referees, she had a Hearts Hibs local derby. Like these are unbelievable opportunities and, and cup finals in the middle there. And Emma, Emma's actually from France. She moved over here, so so we gave she had the opportunity to do a, a Scotland under 17s game. So to see the opportunities they're getting, and you know. It's just amazing for, for what we've come from in five years. Um, and through the Youth Ambassador Program and all this work and seeing, you know, I have my passion for, for women's um, equality and what can we do back in 2017. And I just got, so I just got my FIFA badge. I was just on the Youth Ambassador Program and um, somebody phoned me and they said, what are you doing in three weeks? And I was like, all right, international appointment. Here we go again. Uh, but it's for uh, about two weeks. It's like, where am I going for, for two weeks? Like, what kind of appointment is that? He's like, it's actually a charity game. And I was like, all right, in, in three weeks time. Oh, and he said, um, would you be able to go to uh, Tanzania, climb Kilimanjaro and uh, break a world record for a referee in the highest game of football in the world? <laughs> and I was like, in, in three weeks time, I've actually got a few things on, but um, I went and it was the most unbelievable opportunity of my life and couldn't believe it. So it was a, a charity called Equal Playing Field Initiative. Um, they're hoping to break down barriers and um, raise awareness of gender inequality in sport, currently mainly in football, but we'll, um, they're looking to branch out over, over time. So yeah, so we went with um, 60 women. So like I said, I had three weeks notice to go and, uh, to go and train. So the Pentlands, became my training ground which are a little bit smaller than Kilimanjaro I have to admit but um but yeah I did my training there my, my dad and uh, my now husband uh, came training with me and and it was um amazing um it was um very very tough climb like I say three weeks training I think people like train for years to go and do do Kilimanjaro but um I went it was it was really tough um I was pretty sick. I got altitude sickness, felt pretty awful. Then of course you're feeling sick and you're homesick because you're like, actually, I don't want to be in a tent, like climbing a hill, like or a big hill, um, <laughs> a very big hill. Um, and uh, on the very last day, um, if anybody's done it, I, I don't know, some of, some of you make in Kilimanjaro, you start at about 2 a.m. and it's freezing cold. And the reason you have to do that is because the climb up, uh, the ground's frozen but um, it's normally like scree. So you would just like sink, it would take you, I don't know how long to climb if you did it then. So you have to go when the ground's frozen. So even your like um, camelback water freezes. So then you don't have water. You're climbing for eight hours up this hill. And, uh, and I was like, why, why am I doing this? What, what, what have I done this? And then we got to so the way that Kilimanjaro is, it's a crater. So we got to the kind of point to go down into the crater and it was the most emotional, um moment we're all like this is why you know this is the moment oh my gosh can't believe it um and we went down and we created the pitch so we made a full-size football pitch out of flour and um, because obviously um we didn't want to ruin the environment so we used flour for line lines we did carry goal posts up um which was a bit mental uh, they were quite but um you know we, we did that um and it was also interesting to hear the porter's thoughts that were helping us climb because they were all locals from tanzania and um again it's not a very um female um country for doing sports and, and, and getting out there so it was interesting to hear them they were like oh i'm not really sure how i feel about this and you women doing the game at the top they then became our biggest fans they were standing at the side they'd made signs it was like being in a ground it was amazing and um yeah, they, they actually said at the end, I'm actually going down, go down the mountain, tell my daughter about this. And uh, she's going to get involved. And, and it was amazing. It was, um, and um, it was nil-nil, but it was probably the most exciting nil-nil game of my life. Um, and they did say that um, it would um, feel like four hours of constant football because of how thin the air is. So actually you probably won't reach the top of the mountain, even though you've climbed all this way, gone down into the crater, played the game, you probably won't ever get to the top. And our adrenaline was just so high. I think that I was like, I have not come all this way to not climb to the top. So about 90% of us still climbed up, up after the game. So we'd done an eight hour hike, a 90 minute equivalent four hour game of football, and then climbed the extra hour and a half up and still had to go back down to camp that night. Um, so, so it was pretty crazy. Um, and we always like to leave a legacy. So we left lots of football equipment in the local area. We did a game before we climbed with the girls and things like that in the local area. 
and we got the Guinness World Record for the highest game of football in the world. And it was just unbelievable hearing their stories as well. So the girls that were playing with us were from all over the world. So we had international stars. We did have big names to try and obviously um, get media attention. Um, but we also had girls from Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and more Middle East countries where, and locals from Tanzania, um, Rwanda, et cetera, um, to really have that global aspect. Um, and I know my time, so I'll try to rattle through the last bit, but um, we had a game. Uh, so then I got a phone call about nine months later. Are you free again? I was like, oh, please no climbing, please no man. They're like, we're going to do the lowest game of football in the world. And I was like, ah, much easier, much more up for that one. They didn't tell me we were going to climb, walk like the whole of Jordan to get there, but that was anyway. So it wasn't quite as easy. Um, but what we did was we walked basically, obviously we did get cars at some points to get to the more um, wider areas of Jordan, but we um, walked a lot of Jordan. And in between we ran football camps for girls. Um, we had exhibition matches. Um, uh, and then, yeah, we, we played the, the game at the end. And a story I'll, I'll try and tell really quickly, but the bottom left picture really, um, really resonates. So, so we're running these camps at all the different locations. And at the start of the day, I went, oh, where's today's camp? And they were like, oh, Camel Racing Track. And I was like, what a weird name for a stadium. And then I got there and I was like, it's more races, but like camel and no grass. Like, what? what? Um, so yeah, it was literally a camel racing track, but we, we ran it in kind of the area. But we got there and there was um, machine guns facing into the, to where the girls were all playing. I was like, this is, what what's going on here? And uh, the girls as well were, they were not being naughty, but they were like grabbing the ball, running away. And you're like, come back, come back. What are you doing? You're like, come on. We're trying to teach refereeing skills and football skills here. And, and then it turned out that um, only 90 girls were meant to come, but they sent 190 and we just didn't have the capacity. But actually, in fact, they wanted to send 700 girls. And I was like, why? Why did they want to send all these girls? And um, it wasn't just the, the first time they played football. It wasn't just time first time they played football outside it was the first time they'd been like allowed to just go out and play outside on like yeah they're just um, they're from an area that just is really restrictive and they don't have those opportunities so for me that was just I was like we're changing the world we're changing the world this is it amazing and then um, the next day we got to go to to the pitch that we were in going to play the world record game at um, and Prince Ali in Jordan had actually built the pitch for us. So it was by the Dead Sea, hence Dalkeith to the Dead Sea. Um, and it was by the Dead Sea um, and he built it for us. And we're like, wow, okay, cool. Build a football pitch for us. A uh, bit easier than making that one out of flour at the top of Kilimanjaro. But we're running a football camp the day before and um, a governor from the local area showed up and started having a fight outside the grounds and was trying to get the girls to come off the pitch. Now we were like, we were trying to shield them from it, protect them from it, but he didn't believe that they should be out playing football. They should be at home. They should be learning to look after the household. They should be, and that, and I was like, it almost like kind of broke me from the day before. It was like I thought I was changing the world. I thought, and I was like, oh, we're not. Like this guy's now come along, and there was um, some boys, and they were starting to throw things into the to the pitch, and we were obviously trying to like get the girls and try to show them as normal a game as possible. Um, and I was just a bit broken. But then the next day we were doing our exhibition match and there was maybe not the governor, we'll ignore him, but those same people came back and they were cheering us on. And they actually said, you've actually changed our opinion. And like, and then I thought, you know what? It isn't about just changing the world. It's about changing one or two mindsets to then be able to allow people to have that opportunity. And if I have just changed one or two mindsets in that community to allow girls to be able to go out and play freely and just even play, not even just football, you know, but they could be one day the next Jordanian star, you know, they could they could be going to World Cups, et cetera, and have those opportunities, which would just be amazing for them. And um, so it did just kind of um, change my, my, my thoughts that way. And it was an unbelievable opportunity. And I continue to work with Equal Playing Field now. They've actually broken another, another world record. I was unavailable um, for that one, but, um, but yeah, continue to work for them. And I think they're, trying to get some big plans for next year for the Euros. Um, so yeah, I try to look at everything I do and see that you need a community. You need a community around you. So for me, when I was coming through, it was about um, pushing myself and then like trying to rely on people I could and, and, and what could I do? But then I realized that when 
the female numbers weren't there, what could we do? And it was about having that support system and speaking to people and saying, how can we help you, you know, um, believe and push and achieve what you want to do and, and dare to dream and dare to believe and be who, who you want to do, be and have those opportunities. Um, yeah, and, and make, make your dreams come true, basically, if, if that's for a little girl somewhere else in the world that maybe doesn't have that opportunity today to change that mindset and give them that opportunity, then, then ha happy to, like, just so happy to be involved in that and, and make that opportunity. Um, but I won't leave it onto anything too heavy. Um, sponsors, you've got to love them. Uh, the opportunities, the other stupid things we get to do, but yeah. Me and my dad one day got called to do to do something stupid, so didn't want to leave it on anything too heavy. But um, thank you, I've totally overran. But thank you so much, and, and hopefully that was um, okay. Perfect. Thank you. You are obviously focused on kind of helping people develop skills, I think helping girls develop skills, discover new things about themselves. But what is the one thing that you've learned about yourself that's most surprised you over the over your time as a referee? Oh, uh, that's actually a good question. Um, so yeah, probably the thing that surprised me over time is kind of having that confidence as well. I think, especially when I was 16, I don't think I probably would have got to where I am today in like my job and in real life um, without building that confidence. And it, it definitely does surprise me. Sometimes maybe I don't feel it, but I think, yeah, I surprised myself and probably wouldn't go out and do, wouldn't stand here today and talk in front of everyone and kind of kind of tell that story and yeah the, the confidence definitely does, does su surprise myself sometimes what I can go out and do and being 16 and, and going out and refereeing 22 men uh, on, on the pitch it, it definitely uh, definitely can surprise me from time to time but uh, yeah what, what I'm able to do but yeah. Kind of chimes in what some people said in their uh, kind of breakout session earlier yeah. about kind of different levels of daring and kind of what you can actually push yourself to do. Yeah, it's awesome. Cool, thank you. Um, do we have any questions in the room? And I'll kind of come to you with my roving microphone. Thanks so much, Vicky. That was like properly inspirational. Um, I suppose I can't imagine what it must take to, you know, um, do what you what you've done. I was actually maybe this is a bit negative, but I was wondering, you know, was there any a time, you know, something that happened that might have made you, you know, quit this whole thing? Because there must have been so many challenges. And what did you do to sort of get yourself back on the on the rails? Oh, yeah. definitely there's been many a time I've uh, thought about you know chucking it all in and, and, and you speak to any referee and uh, to be fair you speak to any of them anyone who does anything that they go and uh, yeah there's days that you think why why am I doing this so there was a time what would it have been probably would have been about 2012 so it was about three years in I was doing an under 13s boys game so you're like come on that must be all right and thought I was having a, a decent first half um and um I usually when when I um, when I was starting out, and to be fair, I still do it if I'm out on my own now. I put kind of my water bottle in an area that obviously there's no coaches, no players, no parents, because parents are the worst. Um, <laughs> they are worse than the players and the uh, and the coaches sometimes. But yeah, so I put my water bottle over. I went to go get a half time to have a drink, and uh, I saw a Scottish FA tracksuit approaching me, and I was like, God no, that's that's never good. And uh, he came over and he went, name. I was like, Jeez, Jeez oh. I was like, eh, Vicky, I thought so. Eh, I was like, what does that mean for starters? But um, I was like, eh, he's like, how do you think you're doing? I was like, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, like, I'm, like, even today, I'm still learning. Everybody's still learning everything they do. But like, obviously, I'm only three years in at that point. I'm like, I think I'm having an okay game. Maybe positioning things or here and there. Blah, blah. He's like, having a rubbish game, rubbish game, terrible. And I was like, what? And he laid into me for about like two minutes. And I was like, broken by the end of this. And I was like, all right, okay. I'll be truly honest, I went out and had the worst second half performance you've ever seen. I was given throw-ins the wrong way. I was given easy things the wrong way. And I was just like, what? And cried the whole way home, phoned my dad. I was like, dad, um, what's happening? And, and it, it did, it really broke me. And I said, that's it, I don't, want, I don't want to do it anymore. Why would you ever want to feel like that? And then, yeah, a couple of days later, like, I picked myself up and blah. In fact, my dad actually got a phone call two days later. and. Um, it was, um, my, and he phoned me after, he's like, I've just had a phone call. He's like, um, one of the specialist assistant referees, so that's the guys in the Premier League on the line. Uh, was that your game on Sunday? 
you yellow carded his son in the first half and he wasn't very happy about it. But he thinks he had a conversation with you at halftime that maybe, and it was him. And because I'd yellow carded his son in the first half, he was really annoyed. Um, and uh, I was like, one, he didn't phone me to apologize, which is just ridiculous. But I was just like, that's, that's crazy. But yeah, I just, um, and it just made me think as well, like that's so sad for someone to have gone and done that too probably what would I be 19 20 years old at that point in time to go and do that and you do just kind of have to pick yourself up and there's other situations like being a referee we're human we get things wrong I come away from games and people are you know they're shouting at you saying you got that wrong because you're rubbish and blah blah do you think I go out there and want to get shouted at by so many people do you think I go out there and go do you know what today I'm just going to have the worst performance of my life because I enjoy getting shouted at like no absolutely not um I go away and I I'm the hardest critic on myself. I go away and look up highlights, look up videos. What could I have done better? Could I have been positioned better? But then again, you've got to remember you've got a game next Saturday and you can't keep thinking about that and putting yourself down. So it's definitely a very psychological thing. So I don't think I have an actual answer to how you do. I think it is just, you do need to think back and think of other situations and times and why you do it. And I love it. I obviously do it because I enjoy it and, and have and the community and people I've met and obviously the opportunities that I've been able to do. And I think you do just kind of need to, to push yourself and have that conversation and have that support network around you. Definitely use it. I say that to the girls. I'm like, we have this WhatsApp group. And you know what? It might be, you might think, why am I in this WhatsApp group? It's rubbish. It's people talking nonsense. But I'm like, there's no stupid question. There's no judgment. If you genuinely want support, we are there. Pick up the phone to me. Like, there's a girl in Lanarkshire recently who's just started and she's really struggling with like the sideline abuse. And I was like, right, here's the things we're going to do. I was like, if I'm free, I'll come along and watch a game. I think it is that support network and, and really um, trying to help yourself that way. But yeah. All right, long-winded. <laughs> Got any questions in the Zoom room? Yes, we have indeed. Um, so we have a few. Um, so Jack, I'm saying that it's really inspiring, your talk. Um, and what do you think is one big thing we could do to encourage more girls and women to take leadership roles in sport? That's a really good question. I think um, I think it's really powerful to have more leaders in sport. I think um, especially um, push people when they're younger as well. Um, so I really like there's like um, a sport hour. So I think it's Sports Scotland every the first Monday of every month, they have like a sport hour and it's meant to encourage young people and adults to have an open conversation about um, lots of different topics in sport, about leadership, about change, about um, confidence, about what can we do. And I think, um, yeah, things like that are really important. I think it is just um, encouraging people, encouraging that talent. And if somebody sees it, like there's a lot of girls in, in um, my association and girls I see um, or in the country, like I really try, um, and I'm not saying they don't do it because they definitely do, and they do it without also out knowing it. But like um, the other FIFA girls, um, that we we are obviously out in an international stage, and we get a lot of the kind of high profile games in Scotland that end up on the media now, which is fantastic. But it's pushing them to say, "You are an inspiration, and we need to um, encourage people." And, and what can we do? Um, uh, yeah, and I think it's the same on men and the male and female side and is encouraging people. I really love these like Youth Ambassador of Change programs. I know Sports Scotland have a, um, a panel as well. Um, I think it is just um, important to nurture and encourage these people to really speak up and be passionate about um, how they can help. And it's not just all about gender equality. It's about um, equality for disabilities as well like that's so important for we were doing a lot of that through the youth ambassador program about um fans coming to the games and the experience they have and um, we had a referee who is in a wheelchair and at first he was like well how am i going to referee and what can i do and it was like well there's power power i think it's power league football um or power power football power chair football so he can go and do that futsal is another version of football and he could go and um actually be the they have different referees so they can have like a timekeeper referee it's all about just getting them involved and encouraging them and, and nurturing them to, to have that opportunity to speak out and if you see someone who has an idea encourage it why why not like I don't think any idea is a bad idea I think we should all attempt to look at ideas and maybe they don't all turn out at the end but you know there's probably a little bit of that idea that you can still use somewhere else to encourage something so yeah 
um, so many scary things. Uh, which one was the most terrifying? Oh, definitely, definitely the Kilimanjaro is definitely the most terrifying. Um, like I say, it was that climb um, on the last day, and I genuinely did not think I was making up the, the that last climb. And an interesting thing about it was, and it shows you sometimes how people maybe don't know refereeing and, and don't maybe understand refereeing, they just think about it. So we had, um, so I'm a FIFA assistant referee internationally, um, and then you get a FIFA referee internationally. And they took um, three FIFA referees and two assistant referees. And we were like, why have you brought three referees and only two assistant referees? And they were like, oh, because they can jump in. And I was like, well, no, if this needs to be FIFA accredited to get the world record, which is what, that's why we were there and we'd been asked to do it. And one of the assistant referees doesn't make it to the top. What, what's going to happen? So, and they, you could just see their eyes going, oh no, like we've mocked up and brought three referees and only two thinking that they could jump in and cover. Um, so that was an interesting situation. So that was definitely terrifying and thinking if I don't make it up are they actually going to be able to have the game and it's going to be all be on me because I couldn't climb that last bit um but it was just amazing like I, I, I can't even it's so surreal now it actually almost feels like a dream like it took seven days to climb but I'm actually like did those seven days actually happen and um yeah it was just um so surreal and it really was hearing the stories of the girls from other places and you know we think we have it tough. I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect because it's definitely not perfect here. We have so much more to do. We were talking earlier about how female referees in Scotland don't actually have female kit. We have to wear men's kit because they don't sell it to us. So like, there's no option for us, um, which I think we need to work on and we need to do better. But then you're hearing about girls who aren't even allowed to go outside and play football. So like there, there's two extremes and just hearing those, some of the girls from Saudi Arabia and things like that and, and what they've been through. And so it was a terrifying experience and it's unbelievable, but really those stories, push you on and inspire you and hearing what they've done is 10 times more what, what than what I've done and they're just incredible human beings yeah so much uh Vicky um for ending on that inspiring note as well and um, can we have another huge round of applause <laughs> <laughs>